I had a weird start in the music industry. I started working with Justin Bieber's management team for specifically Justin at like 13. It might have even been 12. I don't know. I was really young. It's all honestly kind of a blur looking back on it. Um, but I was a very big believer. I still am to this day. And I used to go to his shows like religiously. I was like how the Harry fans these days are about Harry. I was like that about Justin. So I would go to shows like constantly. And eventually I just kind of realized like, okay, I got to do something. I got to get involved. I don't know even like I was literally 13 years old. Like I don't, I don't even know how the music industry works. I just knew that I liked music and I liked going to concerts. And so I pretty much just beat my way in basically. Um, and I started a fan account that really, really, really took off. Like I think towards the end of like my involvement and everything, we had like 800,000 followers. It was pretty big. And, and this was like granted like over 10 years ago. So that was like a lot of Twitter followers at the time. It was like 6 million, you know, ratio these days. Um, but I did that for 10 ish years. So how I really got started and we can go into more detail about this if you're curious, but, um, I basically, I was able to get the attention of Scooter and we ended up doing a lot of fan engagement with him, a lot of, um, tour marketing, merch marketing. And, you know, I was literally like 17 years old having to wake up at 8 a.m., to do like a final, but then at 4.30 a.m. that same day, I was awake, like on Twitter, WhatsApping with people, like WhatsApping Scooter, trying to like update fans about the tour and stuff like that. And it was honestly, like I said, it was kind of all a blur and it was a real roller coaster. Um, but by the end of it, I think I started to realize, especially whenever I was getting towards college, you know, making those big kind of life decisions, um, I realized that if I had stayed in that situation, I would have ended up working for a man the rest of my life. <laughs> and I was not really feeling that. So <laughs> I ended up just, you know what, taking the experience for what it was. I had so much experience and knowledge and insight into the like real, really how the industry works at such a young age that I kind of realized that I had, I guess, a responsibility of sorts to not just go back to another job that was similar to that. That was to kind of do something a little bit different, but I didn't really know what that looked like. And I was really foreseeing me ever starting a company would be whenever I was in my late thirties or early forties after I had more time, because at the time, even though I had so much experience, I still was under the impression, I guess, because I was so young and probably because of a lot of the things that were fed to me as like a young woman in music of I really am going to have to earn it. I'm going to have to work like so much harder than everybody else and for so much longer until I can even feel confident enough to start my own business. And so I moved to Nashville and I worked for a pretty well-known music PR firm here for like six-ish months. But from day one, that situation was like super sexist, super racist, and it was just overall a very awful experience. Um, and that was kind of like the breaking point for me. And this was mid pandemic. It was like during the height of the pandemic, I moved to Nashville in February of 2020. <laughs> and then by July is whenever I started Evergreen, like officially formed the LLC. So it was a pretty quick transition, but I'm really glad that I did it because I think if it wasn't for that PR experience and ex really seeing like oh my God, there is so many issues from, you know, all of the isms, but then also on the business side of things of charging independent artists, just thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a month for getting maybe one press release repost that really took five minutes of their time. Um, and it, I really realized like how much of it was just hyped, hyped up by people in the industry who were kind of gatekeeping, honestly, op success and opportunities, especially from young people in business. So um, yeah, I started Evergreen in the summer of 2020. And it has been a wonderful adventure ever since. <laughs> I see it in like the digital marketing side of things too. And like the management side, but it's just the PR world. It's, I guess it's, it, I don't, I really don't have any words to describe it. Like it blows my mind and it's not stopping. I really like, I'm seeing a new agency pop up every other day. And it's really hard whenever we talk to potential clients or, or people in the industry. And we try to explain like, yeah, we do PR, 
but we don't do that PR. Like, <laughs> it's really difficult to explain because I know that all of those other agencies are also probably saying that same song and dance. And it's really hard until the artist actually experiences it with us and sees like, oh, wow, like I actually am getting value for my money. That's something that I deal with on a daily basis as a boss and as somebody who's kind of having to make the decisions of, okay, the next quarter, what are, what are we really putting all of our eggs towards? Like, are we really going to really believe that PR is going to be fruitful for our artists or are we going to pivot that energy and budget towards like social media marketing or ads or things like that? Because it's honestly, it's like, okay, yeah, getting a few PR placements is good for credibility, good for like, I guess, building SEO, but is it going to get the artist a lot of more streams? No, <laughs> honestly, it's really, and it's hard to break it to a lot of people because a lot of artists honestly will come to PR agencies. And I think that this is what continues to fuel that fire is they'll come and they want PR just for an ego boost because they think it's going to somehow validate them in their artistry, even if they only have... 600 monthly listeners. Oh, well, I paid $150 to get on this really good music blog and I get to post it around and make all my friends and family think I'm so cool. And it's just like, we all have to work together to fight against this. <laughs> Oh my God. I mean, it's just like a never ending battle, but I think really starting from like the very beginning of Evergreen, I entered into it with the mindset of there really is a seat at the table for everybody. And just because there are a billion other, you know, Nashville based companies that may do what we do, we, how can we make ourselves different instead of just trying to like put down everybody else while, you know, keeping in mind at the same time, there is a time and a place to call out toxicities and call out wrongdoings. But at the same time, I think that focusing on our lane and really trying to cultivate, I guess, an overall brand and a company that really actually is unique against everybody else will speak for itself. Um, but in terms of gatekeeping, I mean, my God, it, uh, I really, I don't even know. Like it's, especially in Nashville, it's this thing where you, it, I guess the music industry here is really built on partying, socializing and alcoholism. <laughs> That's something that I feel like a lot of people don't talk about a lot. Um, like whenever I was working at a PR agency here, like every weekend I was expected to go to get in the middle of COVID also, like in the height of COVID was expected to go to gatherings, like con like local concerts or any type of like thing that's centered around music and alcohol. But then beyond that, as far as like tangible, um, hey, let me connect you with this person or let me share these emails with you or let me share this strategy that really worked for my artist that might work for yours. There's none of that. But honestly, I believe that a lot of that is because they really don't have the confidence in those strategies to be able to share them because unfortunately I really 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 it sounds crazy to say but I really think that like 85% of the music companies that are doing something similar to what Evergreen is doing right now are for lack of a better term scammers and I and I know that because of having you know personal relationships with the owners of these companies and hearing in social in like friend situations and hearing like how they go about kind of just like avoiding a client if a client's like hey I haven't really heard from you like you were supposed to do this thing and how they go about like just kind of like pacifying that client like getting them to shut up and just sit quiet and continue to pay the retainer because so many of these companies even the one that I was working for they they basically view like their monthly retainers as like um okay the, the artist has to pay on February 1st. So now we just have to get to March 1st and like keep them quiet, keep them happy until March 1st. And then they're going to pay. And then it's the next thing and the next thing. Because in my experience and with friends that have worked for other agencies and stuff, that's how like kind of like the leadership people in these companies treat like the lower down publicists or marketers or whatever. It's kind of like, just do whatever you have to do to make the client happy. Like, make up lies for them or just kind of like say that you're going to do something, but then maybe you only put like five minutes of effort towards it. So all that to say that I, I really think that a lot of like the, the valuable gatekeeping, I hope for people that are actually confident in their strategies and are actually doing good work 
from at least in my little circle that I've been building, it has been very fruitful. But outside of that, I think a lot of the gatekeeping is just because at the end of the day, there's really nothing to gatekeep. <laughs> Anything that anything as far as, of course, like contacts or like, you know, personal connections that you can make for people. That's a different story. But like, as far as like how you're going to market your next single on TikTok or something, honestly, artists can figure that out for themselves if they're driven enough and if they believe in themselves enough and if they have enough time and money to put towards it. But yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of times where artists will come to us, potential clients or whatever. And if they ever are very like number driven, or like you said, like very, very driven by like, I want to get verified, or I want to have like, my goal in the next three months is to have 10 viral videos or like get from 60 followers to 10,000 followers. How are you going to make that? And like, it's always paired with this attitude of like, prove to me how you're going to make this happen for me. And I'm like, well, actually, most of that's going to actually come from you and your hard work. I can give you ideas, but like, I don't know if you're going to do them. <laughs> Especially whenever we have artists who, you know, in a sense, we're really helping them accomplish like their lifelong dream. And on top of that, they're paying us on a monthly basis. And so it's like, I really, yeah, I wish I could just kind of like flip a switch and give you all these followers. But even if you are doing all of our ideas and you're following everything we tell you to do to a T, it's like, sorry, I really, we can't control it at the end of the day. All that we can do is really stay consistent and, and hold you accountable to make sure that you're staying, you know, brainstorming and creating content and doing your due diligence. But beyond that, it's, it's out of our control. And it really does trigger some imposter syndrome. I think for the whole team, honestly, across the board with Liam and PR and Hannah and digital marketing, it's like, well, our hands are kind of tied, but like we're in this leadership position and we feel like we should be able to do something else because we have so much experience and we have so much resources, but we're all victim to the algorithm at the end of the day. In like the last year and a half ish, or more like two years, we've really tried to curate our roster and only work with artists that we are genuinely super jazzed about and that we think that we could do good work for them and actually get them those results. So whenever we're like a huge, genuine, huge fan of one of our artists and it's like, oh, we just like, can we just make Spotify editorial playlists, like actually listen to you and actually pay attention to you? That's a really good question. I mean, yes and no. So it's easy for us to know the kind of, to to pinpoint the artist. So if we're on a playlist or looking at a publication or looking at girl music on Instagram and we happen to see an artist like in, in, if we get that little inkling, like we pretty quickly know if it's going to be a good fit. Um, But where the struggle is, is honestly, there's no money in the music industry and there's no money in independent artists. And unfortunately, it takes money to run a business with multiple employees. And, And we really do our best to really like rate our services super fairly for the artists and like provide and like package discounts and just try to like be able to be flexible with them. But there's always a certain extent where there might be an artist who's actually doing really well on Spotify, is doing really well on socials. And we feel like, oh my gosh, if we just came in and worked with them for even three months, like they would be a star, but then they don't have any kind of budget. And then it's like this weird situation that I've been kind of dealing with internally because not only am I a people pleaser, but I just, I love to help people and I love to give to people like Christmas time. I don't want any gifts. I just want to give gifts to people. <laughs> and so I, I've had that, I've definitely dealt with that since starting Evergreen where we have taken some clients on pretty much for free and we've done like little campaigns for them because I just felt so connected to them and I felt like we could do really good work for them. And it always ends up being like, I never regret doing that, but there, there is a point, And I think this year, especially we're hitting that where it's like, okay, we really have to be selective with who we're going to be donating our time to. And I don't, I don't want to not do that because I think that that's something that's so important and just pushing that positive energy and that empathy back into the industry and teaching these artists that, you know, you don't have to be so starving for a $150 paid placement. You can maybe spend that energy towards like cultivating a community of artists around you in your local area or things like that. Um, but yeah. We've been really trying to cultivate a sense of community, at least in like Nashville, but 
obviously we work with people like from all over the globe, but especially in Nashville, because just because I personally feel like it's so needed here, because like I was saying, it's everything is just driven by like alcohol and partying and like fake industry socializing that doesn't really have anything to do with actual like business or anything. Um, but yeah, like last year we hosted our first showcase where we presented a few of our artists and actually some of them were artists who we weren't even actively working with, but we have such a bond with them and we're actually genuinely friends with him them behind the scenes because we were they were our clients and we just instantly clicked and because of them you know they've referred other clients to us and then we've been able to refer other people to them and back and forth and just you see everybody kind of like leveling up together like everybody's quality of music is getting better because they're leaning on each other and they're writing together and they just, they don't feel so drained and they don't feel so lonely all the time because the loneliness, whether you're physically alone or mentally alone, or if you're surrounded by people, but you're just genuinely not connecting with them on that same wavelength because the industry kind of makes everybody feel like you have to be fake towards each other and just put on a smile and agree with everybody. Um, it, it causes desperation in the artist and it causes them to turn to things like $150 paid placements because they don't really see any other way. Well, like this person's offering me this, there must be, there's nothing else out there for me. So let me do this versus if you had had a conversation with somebody on our team or another artist that's worked with us, that that's been educated about like, actually those aren't really worth it. You really shouldn't do that. And, you know, just word of mouth spreading as much of that Intel and not gatekeeping as much as possible. that is a loaded question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, first and foremost, my mind, even though I hate money and, and like worrying about money, I am very driven like by budgeting and by financing and like saving. And so that is something that I think from the very beginning, even if somebody is sitting in their room and like they've never released music, but they're hoping to maybe like next year, that's their new year's resolution or something the most impactful thing that you can do right now is start saving your money as much as possible. Not so that way you can go and spend it on agencies or whatever, but just so that way, maybe like you get sick and you need to take time off and just kind of like, you know, money equals internal fuel too. Whenever you feel comfortable with your living expenses and that, you know, I'm covered in case of an emergency outside of music, um, that's going to allow you to be so much more creative and let the music kind of flow from you. And then therefore you're going to be able to make better business decisions for yourself as an artist. So the money thing first and foremost, and then I really, I feel like trying to build an authentic group of people that are like-minded and it does not have to be other musicians. It would be a good idea to have a few other musicians to lean on, but it can be videographers, photographers, um, any kind of visual artists, producers, or dancers, anybody who gets the creativity industry. You know what I mean? Um, and just, but also at the same time, like really being serious with yourself about who is, positively feeding into your energy and who is not. Because like I said, a lot of times in this industry, we can fall into this trap of like, well, I'm going to go to this, you know, um, whatever mi networking mixer or something, and I'm just going to make friends with everybody. But then like a lot of those relationships can spiral and spiral and start to deplete your energy or deplete your money. Or, you know, you just fall into situations that might end up holding you back in the long run that you might be just kind of pursuing out of be honest with yourself, maybe it's feeding your ego. Maybe that person has a really cool industry job and you just want to stay connected with them, but you actually like, they don't really like your music and they're not really supporting you or, you know, whatever else it may be. So just trying to cultivate that and, and build really like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people like, um, whenever, it, whenever you click with somebody, like how we're clicking right now, like you and you just kind of, you feel that. And it, like I said, it doesn't have to be other artists and just having that support system to lean on. So that way you can bounce ideas off of, or if you're going to enter into a really big deal with a label or an agency or something and having people that you can use as a honest sounding board, rather than just like people who will be like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let me write that down for myself, actually. Yeah. Carly Rae Jepsen, I want to headline.
I love Carly Rae Jepsen. I love, I love her so much. <laughs> um, and then this one's kind of weird, but I am like my favorite band of all time. And it's like the band that got me into music whenever I was like six years old is Hanson. <laughs> I actually, I have a Penny and Me tattoo after one of their songs. Oh my God, I can't, Beyonce is literally the artist of my life. The artist of all of our lives. Yes, Beyonce. Beyonce should have went all the way to here. Okay, anyway, um, but anyway, um, yeah. So I, yeah, Hanson, Carly Rae Jepsen and Beyonce. 